Hello and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. This is your host, Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for joining us today. On today's show, we have on Kyle Stark, who is a leadership and coaching consultant. Kyle's background is he went to Ball State, got his law degree from Toledo, but he always knew he wanted to be in baseball. So much so that in grad school, he also served as the pitching coach for St. Bonaventure, where he got his master's in business administration. He started in professional baseball as an intern with the Cleveland Indians, and then he was hired by the Pirates and worked his way up to be the assistant GM until 2019. So on the show, we dive deep into coaching and feedback. We take a long look into culture, and we discuss why conversations need to start with clarity, connectedness, and consistency. You're going to love this episode with Kyle Stark. Kyle, welcome to Ahead of the Curve. Pleasure to be here. Definitely. Well, I am so excited to get to interview you today, and I, I, I've done over 200, and I don't, I don't think that I've had a leadership and coaching consultant, and so I'm really excited to get to hear from you and get to learn from you and probably get to be coached up by you today. But for our listeners who want to get to know you a little bit better, can you provide just a short snapshot of you know where you're at currently and how you got there? Sure. Um, so currently, I am. Uh, doing some consulting, coaching uh, coaches and leaders and organizations um, in, in the, you know, performance space, um, wide range of, of um, different people, which has been fun. Um, got here, uh, somewhat of a long journey, grew up uh, playing sports, coaching sports, uh, just passion for sports, specifically baseball. Uh, when I realized I wasn't going to be good enough to play at the highest level, which was way sooner than I wanted, um, I, I knew I wanted to work in the game. And, uh, you know, so – my education, um, law degree, MBA, uh, was, was aimed at those things. Got a chance to coach in college, um, have always enjoyed coaching, passion for coaching, getting a chance to, to help players reach their potential. Um, and then got a chance to, to break in and pro ball with the Cleveland Indians and the front office there was with them for three and a half years, got a chance to do a ton of different things. Um, obviously talented group of people, special um, environment and, and tons of opportunity. And then uh, Neil Huntington got the GM job in Pittsburgh. Um, and I followed him there, uh, was the director of player development, um, evolved into assistant GM, um, focused primarily development and then scouting uh, towards the end of my time there. And then uh, a few of us were asked to go do something else. Uh, and, and so have now transitioned into uh, the, the space I'm in right now, which is, uh, again, trying to help coaches and leaders uh, grow in their own in their own journey. Well, I love that. And, and, and uh, you know, one thing that I think that is is really it, it's starting to gain traction, but I think that we're still a long ways away. And you mentioned it and that's coaching coaches. And so kind of walk us through just your process with that, because I, I mean, it's it, coaches at, and, and you could say teachers are, are the same thing, but, uh, whenever I was a, a teacher, we would always say that teachers are the worst students and I could probably fit coaches in there as well. You know, we like to take in information about strategy, but we don't like to get feedback, uh, uh on our personal coaching a lot of times. So kind of take, take uh just the the base question which is you know how do we coach coaches and how do we do a good job at it and then we'll, we'll just kind of run from there yeah so i think it, it's been fun for me to watch over the last 15 years uh 15 to 20 years just uh trends in baseball especially on the development side I, you know i think um, the game has always been built on scouting um on evaluation and you know, I think the minor leagues was always uh, part necessary evil, part, um, you know, filtering process. And, uh, you know, the cream would rise to the, to the top. And so, you know, I think a few organizations felt like there was more to it than that. Uh, I think Cleveland was one of them. Uh, we certainly uh, committed to that in Pittsburgh and felt like we impacted the landscape along those lines as well, that we felt like you could help players get better through, uh, through coaching. And, um, you know, so... And now you see, obviously, where it's a huge business and lots of people have different thoughts and ideas uh, on the on the development space and specifically coaching coaches. And I and I think when you think about coaching coaches, um, you know, for us, initially, it was very much about trying to help our guys be the best they could be, because um, the only way I, I believe the way you help players be the best they can be is you help coaches be the best they can be. And so some of that was, um, 
you know, what's the science say? Some of that is best practices and getting uh, studying other coaches and getting guys to share with each other. Um, and then I think part of it is having specific development plans for, for guys, right. Instead of, uh, just pour into players and they've got goals and they've got development plans, whatever else to make sure that, that coaches, you know, have the same. And so I think through that process, um, you know, again, trying to blend the science with the art, with best practices, recognizing that great coaching has always been great coaching. Um, they've always, great coaches have always done a lot of things we've identified. They maybe didn't know the scientific term for it or whatever else. Um, but also recognizing that a lot of the science has been around for a while too. These aren't necessarily new revolutionary um, things. It's, it's how do you put them together? How do you help that coach be the best he can be? Because it come, uh, you know, great coaches come in a lot of shapes and sizes. I think sometimes we can get a little too rigid and try to pigeonhole guys. Um, but to make sure that we've got an opportunity to help coaches be the best they can be um, and maximize their strengths. No, I love that. So tell us a little bit more about some of the best practices that you're talking about. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, I think the first thing is that the the uh, coach knows himself, right? Knows him or herself, knows what uh, his strengths are, knows uh, maybe what his weaknesses are. Um, I think a lot of times as, as coaches and leaders, we can try to emulate other people we admire, um, and a lot of times what we're emulating is style or stylistic differences as opposed to actual, um, you know, key, key practices. So I think the first part is really, truly knowing yourself and, and knowing what you do well um, and knowing what, what your weaknesses are. I think the second part is um, 100% an attitude, a mindset of um, that, that this is about the player, which, again, I think all of us say that, but I think there's some times we can get tripped up. Um, and, and get distracted, but it's truly about the player's uh, growth and journey. Um, and, and that my responsibility is to help him figure it out, help him, uh, you know, cause to learn. I think that a lot of times, um, I think we can equate coaching with telling. Um, we can equate coaching with fixing. We equate coaching. And I think that's a very rigid, very narrow um, perspective of, of coaching. I think coaching is far broader than that. Think about all the different ways you can influence somebody from, from the environment that's created um, to, you know, asking questions, to giving feedback, to giving the, the um, athlete an experience, to being an example and modeling. You know, you touched on in terms of we want um, players to be great learners or we great learners. If we're great learners and constantly trying to, to get better than, um, you know, I think that frees uh, players up to do that. So this idea that coaching is broader than that and that my job's to ultimately create an environment, uh, come up with an experience, a drill, a situation, whatever else, and structure things in such a way that causes uh, the player to be freed up, causes the player to learn, um, and then go from there. And then I think, um, you know, probably the other big one for, for coaches uh, best practices. Um, do I truly understand the player in front of me? Do I truly understand um, how he's wired, that this is unique, um, that this individual is unique, that I understand where he's at in the process, and that I'm going to then use all my different resources I have to individualize, um, you know, what we're doing specifically for that, for that specific player in front of me. Oh, that's great. That's, it's really good. And it sounds very, very similar to kind of a player development plan is knowing myself, uh, having goals, uh, giving good feedback. And, and I, th I think that something that I've been really trying to dig more into is how do we, you know, how do we know if we're a good coach? And I think that that's a question that it seems silly on the surface, but I think good coaches are obviously really good with good players but how do we know if we're an, an actually good coach or we just have good players because we could be a bad coach with good players or a good coach with bad players and if we look at it just by on-field results then I think that 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 data can be skewed and so if we're talking about you know good giving good coaches giving coaches good feedback or even getting you know some self-feedback what are some different areas that we can look to or what are just some different ways that that we, we talk about feedback loops with players all the time and we want them to be tight. How do we do that with coaches? 
No, I think that's a great point. I think it's something we wrestle with. And I, I think the first thing we have to come to grips with is the fact that it is going to be messy. It's not going to be a nice, neat, clean, well, we can right. look at this one metric and it's going to answer our questions. Um, you know, and I have to be good with that. I have to be okay with that, that there's a ton of variables. There's a ton of gray here and we're going to have to look at some different indicators of success, right? So what could those indicators be? I think the first one, my job as a coach is to get the most out of the player and team in front of me, right? So ultimately I want to be looking at, um, Where's a player at? What's his potential? Uh, you know, what is his maybe ceiling, whatever else, but not even so much that is just, are we getting players better? I think you can look at, at um, coaches and say, well, we think the player's ceiling is X and he's here. Um, you know, how close are we? But a lot of times we're wrong on what that ceiling is, right? So it's not even so much that as much as are we seeing growth in players? And that can show up in, in um, performance, we can see, you know, we have clarity in terms of exactly how are we measuring something and are we seeing that? But it can also show up in us noticing things, right? We see a player do something we hadn't seen him do before. We see a player do it more consistently than we had before. Um, I don't think, I think that having a measure that can give us some indicator of, of um, progress is important, but I think there's a lot more to the story than that even. There, there's always more variables that go into it. I have to be good with that. I have to factor that in. So I think as we talk about coaches, it's are we seeing growth in players? I think the other part of it is if as a coach we've gone through and we've identified potentially an area that we need to get better based on what the science says, based on what the art says, and again, it's a mix of those two, if I've got an idea of what needs to get better, now I can start assessing how much better I'm, I am at doing it and or how uh, much more consistent I am at doing it. Perfect example, uh, you know, I think as coaches, a lot of times we like to talk a lot. We like to hear ourselves uh, talk at times. And so we may be talking and, and uh, uh, you know, me and a coach and identifying, okay, something we need to get better at is asking more questions and talking less or giving less statements. So in that case, now as a supervisor or as, as a leader, I, I'm going to be observing those behaviors, um, you know, catch the coach doing right, giving the coach feedback on where we might be making progress with it. Um, and then in a perfect world, we're tying it then to the ultimate outcome, which is, which is player growth as well. Um, so I think when we've got clarity on something specific we want to improve, um, we can start to hunt those behaviors and assess how consistently they are or are not happening. No, that's, I love that. And, and I love the clarity piece behind it. I love the, I think great coaches have the ability to ask great questions. And, and one of, you know, I just, as, as a short story and, and we'll get to get back to you, but this last week I was helping a friend of mine uh, with a facility here in Tulsa and one of the players was coming in and they had just, you know, gone over some Rapsodo testing uh, at, a, at, a, at his high school and so the player comes in and, and he was telling my friend, Jeff, uh, and he was saying, he was tell, talking to him about uh, his curveball spin rate. And he was like, yeah, my, you know, my fastball was this and my curveball was this. And Jeff goes, okay, so what does that mean to you? And I was just taken aback by that question just because it's like, if, if the player doesn't have an answer for that, then it really doesn't mean anything. It's just a number. And so I was just like, wow, the power of one question that can really just change an entire conversation. And I just, I was, you know, I love that question. I, I wrote it down and I was like, man, it, it, that's part of one. It's, it's good coaching with players to know that and have that understanding. It may not be the first time that you have that conversation with them, but by the end of, you know, whatever program that you're on, they need to completely understand, you know, what's expected, what you're trying to do, what these things mean. Uh, to a certain extent. And I guess that goes back to knowing the player too, because some players just want the minimum effective dose. And then some guys, you know, like yourself who want to be future GMs, they, they want to know the entirety of information. So I, I, that's really tough too, like being able to balance those two things and trying to figure out what they're doing. And, and like you mentioned, uh, coaches talk way too much and I, I find myself doing that way, way too much. And, and it's just, it's just a really interesting conversation to have with, with, with all of that. But any, anyways, anything that you'd like to add to any of that? No, I, I think that that's really good. And I think the, um, I think we all fall into that, um, you know, uh, um, Tim Elmore talks about the guide on the side versus the sage on the stage. I think when we recognize our job is to guide, it's to facilitate learning. Our approach is way different. And that goes for coaches and leaders. Mm, really um, I fall in the same trap. 
you know, it's my job is to cause a player to learn is to facilitate it as opposed to lecture, give the answer, fix the problem. Um, and, and I think sometimes we fall in the trap, you know, the goal is excellence. The goal isn't efficiency. I'd like to be as efficient as possible, but the goal is excellence. And when the, so sometimes we can trick ourselves into thinking, well, we don't have time. We need to speed this up. And so I step in and a lot of times I actually interrupt the learning process that's happening by stepping in and fixing or giving the answer. And that's why that question piece is huge because ultimately we are facilitating learning, um, which is the player taking ownership of that as opposed to, you know, me, the coach. Coach is absolutely critical. I think sometimes we can fall into this trap of thinking, well, the players are driving this process. The players have ownership for sure. Um, the coaches cannot transfer their ownership to the player and say, well, he either did or didn't figure it out. Um, however, the coach is critical. He has a role in the process that he's got to make sure that he's he's doing to help facilitate this process along. No, that's great. That's a great, great answer. And thank you for for adding to to my rambling there. I thought that was really, really good. So another another initiative that you're really you know, you do a really great job of, and and you've gotten to see really all kinds of inner workings within that, and and that's culture. And for me, and I, I don't know how you feel about this, to be completely honest, but I feel like things start in a really a, a great direction, and then sometimes they get to just be buzzwords. And I feel like you know, culture is obviously really, really important, but I think it's developing into a buzz a buzzword of and kind of growth mindset is another one that that I've noticed lately that people just use to be able to just uh, to describe different things but they don't know what it truly means and so what i'd like to know from you is what is culture in your opinion no i think you're you're hammering uh you're hitting something that is definitely near and dear to my heart in terms of where okay. we okay. have taken um concepts that matter and we've um short change them, we've used them incorrectly, whatever else, and they've become buzzwords, which then undermines um, their importance with a lot of people. You know, I like to think about, and whether it's culture, or what, um, you can talk about whatever, but um, specifically with culture, if, you, if you've got a, a graph and you've got a, on one axis, you've got um, the, the how often you talk about it, how often you stress the importance of it, whatever else, and then you've got on another axis, how often you actually do it, how often you carry out those principles, which is some of what you were, what you were getting at as well. You know, in, in one quadrant, you have those who talk, the talk matches the do, um, the talk matches the walk. They, they are great culture drivers. They talk about it. They stress the importance and they carry it out. The opposite quadrant are the opposite where they said it doesn't matter. They're not doing it. And it's complete dysfunction. Most people fit into the other two quadrants, right? So the one quadrant are the people who talk up the talk, <laughs> but maybe don't walk the walk. And that, that's where I think you're talking about those buzzwords happen. You know, people, uh -huh. uh, we got posters on the wall, whatever else. The flip side is I've been around some really talented coaches who have gotten turned off by the buzzwords and they don't talk about culture. That ah, culture is overrated. Um, I'll give you an example of talking with, with a guy one time and he goes, ah, culture is overrated. I'm not about culture. I'm just about getting high character people into a really competitive environment. We're just going to go compete. <laughs> I'm like, no, that's your culture. It's You've culture. <laughs> defined what it is and you do culture. I, if I can only have one or the other, I want people to do culture. Personally, I think when when we um, we acknowledge the importance of it and can, and can notice some of these things, you know, I think that there's enhancement to that. Um, but that's a, a long winded way of talking about how different people wrestle with it. For me, at the end of the day, the culture is who you are, right? It is the sum of um, your your people, your processes, your pursuit, where you're going. It is the sum of your attitudes and your actions. Um, it is who you are. Um, we all have a culture. It's just a matter of whether it is by design that you intentionally try to create and cultivate and, and um, continue to try to enhance and bring to life, or it's by default. You're not intentional with it and you end up with one. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that the best leaders, best coaches are very intentional about creating the, the culture they want. No, I love that. I think, and that plays right into something that I've always, always thought that culture was, and that was, I don't know, I don't know if you're familiar with Brian Kite and, and the Focus 3 guys yep. uh, and Urban Meyer now, but he talks about culture being belief, behavior, and experience and those three things. And it goes right into what you were talking about was, which is we do culture. We don't, we don't just talk about it. 
And I've always really liked that because if you have those three things and that in a sense is culture, uh, but what are some absolutes in culture building? So let's say that, you know, we, we started, we got hired to run an organization and we, we were starting tomorrow. And so what would kind of be our first steps in developing a culture, understanding what the culture is? We were hired probably for a reason, and that's to change maybe the culture or at least parts of it. And so let's, let's talk a little bit about just some different ways that we can go about building a, or starting a culture, and then we can go into building it a little bit too. No, that's, that's great. So I think as you talk about going into a place before I kind of hit at the absolutes of it, um, you know, when I got hired in Pittsburgh, um, everyone I talked to said, Hey, you need to go in there and just use this first year to assess. Um, my personality is not wired that way. So it was, let's get going. <laughs> um, part of it though, is I wanted um, clarity on the front end of who we were going to be. So I could find out who aspired to that, who wanted to be a part of that, who was, um, who did that line up with? Because, um, you know, our job as coaches is to get the most out of the players we have. Our job as leaders is to get the most out of the people we have, but also <laughs> recognize where do we need to um, potentially change people because uh, the, the cultural fit's not going to be perfect for everyone. So um, so I wanted to make sure that we, we did some significant work on the front end and didn't just use a year of assessment. I think the one thing that I would say, though, with that, and this is, would be for all leaders or coaches going into a situation – I don't think we can assess enough. I think too often we try, we shortchange uh, our assessment. We shortchange what we think is going on. We want to create a nice, simple narrative to try to explain things, which is the way our minds work. And we end up maybe not having the most accurate view of what really is. Um, so we may go in and have clarity on the front end of what we want to establish, whatever else. But part of that process as we're going is, is constant assessment. Shifting to the question of, of what are those absolutes, you know, I think ultimately for me, there's got to be clarity. Without clarity, you know, um, Rod Olson um, talks about uh, um, lack of clarity leads to a decrease in performance. If we don't have clarity of what matters or of where we're going, of who we want to be, then there's going to be a fog, there's going to be muddiness, and we're not going to be able to operate at our, at our highest level. So the first part is, do I have clarity? And when we think we have clarity, we probably need to do some more work to drill down and make it even more clear. Um, simple wins. Um, simple doesn't mean a short changed, um, shallow process. It means that we work through the complexity to get on the backside so that I have simplified it and we've got clarity on, on what matters. Um, the second key thing that I think has to happen is uh, connection, right? The ideas have to be connected. Our purpose has to connect with our values. Um, our people have to be connected, um, which is, is a messy process in itself of how, how do we you develop that trust where, um, you know, we can be connected and operate as one because ultimately that culture, the more... Um, Singular, the focus, the more one heartbeat to it, the better chance that you have of, of operating at your at your highest potential, um, you know, where two people can actually be performance enhancers for each other because of the trust that's established. Um, so this idea of connection. And then the third piece is that that at the end of the day, the most consistent person, culture, team, whatever wins. I think a lot of times we want we get pulled to the. Uh, the dramatic, the theatrical, the highest, the best, and really it's the consistency piece, which is part of the reason why I love baseball. Baseball brings this out every day. Um, you know, there's a line in baseball about, hey, how do you want to, you know, how do you become great? Well, you go become good and do it every single day. How do you become good? Go do your job and do it every single day. The consistency piece is what ultimately, um, you know, wins. And I think that's where, as you were talking about, um, you know, Brian Kite and those guys with, with the behaviors, how consistent mm -hmm. can our behaviors be? More often than not, people are saying the right things and valuing generally the right things. Um, have I have I gained clarity? Have we got us connected? And then, how consistent are we applying it? Oh, it's really good. The you call that the three C's of culture? Yeah. Oh, I really like that. That's perfect. So you start with clarity, uh, and and that's basically 
trying to decide who and what you want to be and what you want to be clear on. But let's talk a little bit about connectedness. Now, whenever you mention that, are you talking coach to coach, coach to front office, coach to players, all of the above? And if so, what are some different ways that are practical ways that you found to be able to to be more connected with within the groups? All of the above. Um, I think the connectedness starts with connected uh, um, ideas. Um, you know, I think a lot of times organizations, cultures, teams have rules, principles, standards, ideas, expect whatever else, and they're not necessarily coherent with each other. They're they're not necessarily connected. I can't make sense of them, and so that obviously impacts the lack of clarity. Um, but then that connectedness ultimately shows up in a person to person thing. And that's, you know, ultimately we want it to show up on the field player to player. Right. Um, but that has to then be um, a product of more often than not um, coach to player, which is more often than not a function of coach to coach, which is more often than not a function of, of coach to front office. And then that connectedness in the front office, which ultimately starts at the top is your, is your, um, ultimate leadership team, the most connected, cohesive team in the world. Um, and I think just like all these things, they become buzzwords and they get um, shortchanged, whatever else. Um, you know, when you think about connected, um, you, we can think about it in terms of on the personal social side that we like each other, which, yeah, that can be a huge um, benefit to this. But ultimately, we're talking about an alignment on the task side, right? That there is Perfect. connectedness on, um, you know, what the mission is. Um, and, and so I think as you talk about practical ways to develop that, um, I think some of it ties into what we we're talking about clarity. If I don't have clarity, it's going to be hard to be connected. Uh, number two, there is no substitute for time. We have to spend time together. Um, you know, I think a lot of people gripe about meetings or about um you know, getting together or whatever else at the end of the day, if we're not spending time together, there's no chance for connection to happen. Um, and then I think the other part of it is, have I created an environment where there is genuine care for each other, genuine interest in each other, and a genuine um, willingness to be myself with each other so that we can truly get to know each other and understand where we're coming from? Well, it's really, really good. So one of the things that that I, I think that we can circle back to a little bit is that uh, coaching feedback. And so uh, I know that, that your culture, that you you want clarity, connected, connectedness, sorry, <laughs> and consistency. And so I'm thinking about, okay, so part of that, you're wanting coaches to have the true definition of a growth mindset is with which is trying to continue to to improve on things that, that some people think that they can't improve on and so let's let's talk a, a little bit about feedback too because i think that that ties right into the culture and so you've been in, in a front office and and you've d seen all of these these different things that have uh that have gone down on a consistent basis and so i'm, I'm curious you know what are some be, some of the best practices when giving feedback and then where are some what are some ways that that have gone wrong i guess because i i'm thinking you know if you don't give feedback right then you've almost lost the player and and at some points you lose the coach and you lose you may not lose them as far as their job goes but you lose their ear and then that it just goes all downhill from there so just so, what are some of your best practices with giving feedback because if they don't fit quite into the culture. You don't want to just get rid of them, but you also want to give them good feedback on, you know, where their the disconnect is. And so what are some best practices and then what are some ways that uh, maybe not you have failed, but what are some ways that you've seen that have not been some of the best practices? No, I can tell you about where I failed. I think that those are some of our best okay. opportunities sure. to, to learn from. Um, you know, I think when I, when I think about feedback, um, and, and I guess the first thing I'll share is player, but I think this applies to, to coaches and applies to us as well. The sure. more that um, that feedback is not dependent on someone else just telling us right or wrong, the better that's going to play out, right? I mean, science shows us this. When the, when the actual drill or activity gives me the feedback, that's better than some coach telling me what to do. When the experience I go through gives me some feedback, as opposed to just somebody telling me good or bad, there's more value to that. When I have taken ownership of what that feedback looks like, 
it's better for us than if I'm just dependent on somebody else. So I think that, you know, as you think about that feedback, those, those are some things I think for us to keep in mind. Again, obvious with player or coach dynamic, but I think the same thing applies for leaders, coaches, coach to coach, um, as we think about some principles of feedback. Um, I think as you go more broader and think about, um, you know, what are some keys to to that feedback being maximized beyond the, the, that first point? I think so much of our time is spent on the actual giving of the feedback and we don't spend enough time on the conditions for the feedback. We don't spend enough time about the environment we're operating in. This is why for me, culture is critical. Do I have a culture where feedback is, feedback is expected and desired? If so, I probably don't have to be as perfect in delivering my actual feedback. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if I've created that environment where people are trying to get better, people want to get better, people want the feedback in, in order to help them do that. Um, you know, the other part of it is, do I trust you? Um, you know, we've talked about all the time where players ask themselves three questions, right? Do you care about me? Can I trust you? Can you help me get better? And if the answer to those questions is yes, then I'm probably not as a player going to be sitting there and evaluating your actual delivery because I'm trusting where it's coming from. And so, you know, I think the environment that's created, the relationship that's created, um, you know, some of my worst uh, times given feedback, I hadn't done the work to create the relationship where that person knew I cared about them. When the person knew I cared about them, they didn't get as caught up in my delivery of it. Um, Mm -hmm. The last thing that I'll I'll say, uh, well, one other thing and then then, um, one other key with the feedback piece is. I I try to remind myself, assuming if there's a breakdown in one of those first two principles, how would I want the information? And in a perfect world, (laughs) how does this individual want the information? I think a lot of times as coaches and leaders, we give feedback based on what works for us. um, And then sometimes we don't factor in that this is a completely different person. We talked about this at the beginning, right? What's his personality, his or her personality? What's his or her uh, interest dynamics? What are all the things going on in this individual's life in terms of how they're going to receive this? And the more I can factor that in, the better off we are. Um, Last piece I'll just share with with feedback here before we go wherever with this is, I think a lot of times... um, Rarely do I see an environment where there's um, where where coaches and leaders and people are going, wow, my boss just is telling me too often where I stand and what I need to get better at. More often than not, it's the exact opposite. That I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't. I have no idea. And so I think for a for a a leader to default towards again, this was where the clarity piece comes in. Is there clarity on on where we stand and and where we need to get better? Am I given the feedback I need to? At the end of the day, the question's not should I or shouldn't I? The feedback has to be given. I think a lot of times we'll talk ourselves out of that because it's uncomfortable, whatever else. We have to do it. It's now a matter of saying, how do we do it best? More often than not, people want it and we overcook, uh, overthink um, the, the delivery of it and end up not giving it in a timely manner. And we miss that opportunity. Sure. It seems like a lot of your, a lot of your concepts come back to first clarity and tell us a little bit more about that. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll tell a story to give, to, to bring this to light. So, um, over the years, I've worked with a ton of coaches, um, and coaches at the lower levels. They want to get to the upper levels so they can work on more complex things with players. They want to be able to do whatever else. And there's no doubt that there is an element of, of truth to that. Um, however, I'll never forget um, starting with Cleveland Indians and uh, working with Carl Willis, who I think is a phenomenal coach. He's one of the best in the game. He doesn't get enough credit for what he's done and what he does with, with pitchers. Um, and I remember talking with him and it was like, hey, we got to throw more first pitch strikes. And I, coming from college, having coached in college, I'm thinking – a lot of the big leagues, that's what we're talking about right now. <laughs> and it was a reminder for me that the game is the game. The game requires certain things. And more often than not, we overcomplicate it because there's a lot of 
stuff going on <laughs> that gets us distracted from what matters. Um, stuff going on on the field, stuff going on off the field. And so I think that's where that clarity piece comes in. When there, We just have to understand that more often than not, we're operating in a fog. There are other things um, that, that make things messier, that make things um, more complex. Um, if you think about society and what society values are not necessarily what is required for excellence. Um, and so we're competing with all these different things, all the different messages that we're bombarded with. So I need to figure out how can I simplify, get a, a sniper focus on something and, and, and help my people, my players uh, have the best opportunity to go execute at their highest level. I love that. And, and anytime you can weave in a, a good story like that, I, I think that uh, I, I just, I love that. I love good story, good stories and, and good storytelling. And so another, another part with clarity or another piece with clarity, because I, I'm right there with you. I think that, you know, we, we do tend to overcomplicate things. And sometimes I just wonder with players, and this is a thought that I've had for a while is, are, do they truly know what what they need to do to accomplish their goal? And I, I know I didn't as a player, and that may be why you know we're sitting here having this conversation. Uh, but what, are your goals clear? And then do you have uh, at least a clear idea of what it's going to take to get there? And you know, I I don't I think that you know with with the amount of information that's in the game, with most sports, the amount of information that's online that a lot of players are just they get lost in it and so then i I think that they could they could potentially revert back to okay that i'm just going to do with what i'm comfortable with because you know i coach is asking me to do x y and z instead of like one thing and so just thinking about thinking about clarity and coaching i mean just what are some different ways that we can do better and what are some you know just looking at it from a coaching perspective because i know that i tend to talk too much or overcomplicate things or ask them to do too many things with ask without just really breaking it down to, okay, what's the one thing that they need to do? Can you hit on that a little bit? Because I, I'm sure we all have been there before. And so what are, what are some different ways that we can do better with clarity? Yeah, I, I think that's great. I, I think, um, the, I, I think a lot of times we think the answer is more, right? The answer is more complex, more information, more whatever. Um, you know, I, I remember having a conversation with um, with Scott Ellerton, uh, just a true professional. How you know, as a player, but and I got a chance to be around him as a player, but then also as a, as a coach and, and as a leader. And we were having a conversation about, um, you know, I think a lot of us grow up, we joke around about the North American style of coaching is more, it's intensity, right? It's more about the intensity of something, do it more, do it harder, do it whatever else, as opposed to uh, the consistency of it. And, and I think we fall into that as coaches the same way, um, more information, more complex, more, um, and, and all the tools in society that are out there, I think, pull us that way as opposed to recognizing all the tools and information should be a lot, should be leading us towards, again, this is where you get through that process, get through the complex over to the, to the simplified piece to be able to identify, you know, the one thing, one of the things that we would do that we used a lot is that idea of a one thing. What is the one thing that I need to nail? Um, now we can sit here and debate whether we're right or not on that, but I guarantee you, if I've got a one thing focus, I've got a better chance of moving forward than if I've got a multitude of things. The next step then is, can I make sure that the one thing is the right thing? And in that case, that's where as a coach, I've got to make sure that I have done the work, right? I, I know all the ingredients, how they fit together for the specific player. I can prioritize the right way and work through all the information to deduce down to, to one thing. Um, I think the other part of it for us as coaches is to make sure we've prioritized our impact on players. Where really is our biggest impact? And I think a lot of times, again, we fall into the information trap. Well, if I, if I have the right information, if I give the right information, you know, when I broke in into pro ball, uh, on the coaching and leading side that I had people tell me information is power. Well, it's not power anymore because it's so accessible everywhere, but it is potentially overwhelming. And I don't believe that the best that, that the that the coach. Uh, I don't think it's always just a matter of information. Um, 
it, learning and development is certainly not a matter of, well, just a, apply the right information. It's way messier than that, that. There's way more that goes into that. Um, you know, so I, I think as a coach, do I have clarity on really where my impact is? Um, we used to do an exercise every year at the start of spring training to, to bring this very thing to light. And we would ask, okay, on the paper in front of you, go ahead and write down the most influential, most impactful coach you ever had in your life. And so everybody writes it down. And then underneath that, I'd ask the guys to write down why were they in the most influential and impactful coach in your life? You know, we have a hundred coaches in the room. And then I'd ask the room, how many of you guys wrote down because they fixed your swing or fixed your delivery? Nobody's hand ever went up. <laughs> how many, how many uh, guys wrote, uh, wrote that coach down? Because think about whatever information being added to them could be. That was never the case. At the end of the day, the things that impacted players the most were they got them to believe in themselves. They taught them how to be an unbelievable competitor. They taught them how to be a pro. Um, they taught them how to deal with adversity. They taught them these things that ultimately is what the game um, exposes so that you can then apply the information. It's not to say the information doesn't matter. It does. I think as coaches, though, sometimes we can get out of whack in terms of what we're prioritizing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that then leads to confusion because I don't have clarity in my mind of what matters most for me as a coach. Do you think that we coach based on our biases? So let, let me, well, let me, one, that's, that is the question, but let me backtrack a little bit. So do you think that we coach to our biases on what we think that we wanted to have as a player? I think there's an element of that. I mean, we used to, we used to joke around about, we'd ask coaches, okay, what type of player were you? You either wanted that more of that, or you wanted the opposite of that, right? We joke yeah, around about yeah. this, this short scrappy guy who wants the big physical guy that can, you know, has all the tools. We talk right, about yeah. the, the, you know, the guy, whatever his weakness was. And so he's looking for the opposite of that. Um, but I, but I think the other part of it is, and, and uh, Joe Ehrman does a lot of really good stuff with this, um, in his book, Inside Out Coaching, making sense of why do you coach the way you do, which is what you're talking about. There's a good chance that you coach the way you do because of different influences in your life, different experiences in your life. Not that it's right or wrong, but if I've made sense of that, then I can probably make some adjustments accordingly because at the end of the day, I'm not coaching me, I'm coaching this individual in front of me. Um, and, and so I think that's, you know, as you're talking about biases, experiences, I mean, we're the sum of all these things, right? And sometimes it, it um, and I'll, probably a lot of times it actually, it benefits us to stay in that sweet spot. Um, but it also causes us to miss certain situations, different people, whatever else. And, and I think that's where if I've made sense of why I'm coaching the way I do and I have clarity in terms of who is in front of me, I can better tailor whatever I need to do to that, to that individual. I think the other part of it, and I think part of what you're getting at where I think we just fall into as a trap as a coach, as a coach, I'm not playing anymore. So I'm not in the trenches doing. So what am I doing? I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm constantly thinking. And, and society today, I mean, we there's people making lots of money just thinking. <laughs> so I think we have prioritized, and a part of it's what you're talking about in terms of where growth mindset may or may not have gotten tweaked and getting off, off the rails a little bit, where it's like, oh, just it's about information and consuming, 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 learning, growing, but, and all these things that not, I'm not saying that those things don't matter, but I think we've probably um, reprioritized, gotten off the rails a little bit. And some of it's just a matter of I'm not playing anymore. I'm coaching. So I'm thinking a lot. And so when I'm thinking a lot, I'm spending a lot of time and in information and that's the world I'm in. That's not necessarily the world the player's always in. No, it's really, really good. While you're on the, while you're on the, the subject of growth mindset, I, I know that that's, that's probably something that has been brought up in every interview in America in the last, I don't know, five or eight years. And so tell us a little bit about what growth mindset means to you. Like, what do you, what do you truly, whenever you see it, what does it look like? What does it feel like? What is, I, I think we're all trying to have a growth, a quote unquote growth mindset, but I also think it, it's dependent on context too, because there are areas of my life where I'm more closed minded than growth minded and being able to, to understand what those are. And to, I mean, that's just part of my bias too. And, and being able to, to recognize that and change that when needed, I think is important. But I'd love to hear you. You, I've brought up growth mindset. You've uh, brought it brought it up a couple of times as well. So, what does it mean to you? 
Yeah, I, I try to stay pure to what the experts say, right? What Carol Dweck says in terms of it's a belief that um, I can improve. It's a belief that uh, my current state can be changed, right? Um, you know, I think a lot of time, and you hit the nail on the head. I, I jo- I've joked with some people, you know, the last manager search I was a part of, I joked with, I said, we could have had anybody prepared for the interview because you heard the same things, right? Uh, growth mindset, collaboration, and psychological safety. Um, and, and it's, and, and you think about this, yeah, does trust matter? Yeah, it's always mattered. I mean, now we got a fancy term for it. Uh, growth mindset, you know, then you start asking questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm a big reader. What are you reading right now? Well, I'm not reading anything right now. Okay. Let's get past the buzzwords <laughs> that we're talking about. Uh, um, sure. you know, I think a lot of times we've taken growth mindset to mean a lot of different ideas, um, at its purest form. And I think this is critical for if a coach does not have a growth mindset, not even so much for himself, although it's important, but in terms of he doesn't have that belief, then you fall into the same trap of, you know, the cream will rise to the top. Um, you know, the, the player is what he is. All these different types of things that, that good coaches don't believe they don't talk about. They believe that this player can get better. His current state can change. So it's absolutely uh, critical. I think a lot of where we apply it in some of these other situations is we equate it to learning. We equate it to um, wanting to learn. We equate it to, um, you know, more of a, a, a positive mindset. We've, we, you've used this term to be way broader than it, than it probably needs to be. I think it's absolutely critical because if I believe that at its purest form, I believe that we can get better. That's at the core. And that's what, if you're coaching in your development, that's, you kind of got to believe that. Um, it does a few things for your culture as well. I think, um, number one, it uh, gets us um, moving towards something, right? It, it's not a, um, we're, we're on this journey, we're on this process of getting better. So it gives some, some direction there. The second thing I think it does is it, um, it gets us, especially in a male dominated environment, it gets us to stop posing, pretend posture and acting like we've got it all figured out. Because as soon as I say that I can improve, I'm acknowledging I'm not perfect. So let's stop acting like we are, which, which we just do as guys, especially, but I think we do it in society today, social media, whatever else, trying to put on our best front. The growth mindset piece for me creates a humility, creates a vulnerability where we're acknowledging that's not the case, which allows us then to do the third thing, which is actually connect and trust each other um, and, and recognize that we're all on this journey together. So let's go. No, I love that. And I, I, for some reason, I've, I've been on the been on a, a growth mindset kick lately too of, you know, it is, a, I guess more of a buzzword kick of, okay, what are some of the different buzzwords going on? And, and it's interesting, especially with the world of social media that we're in to, to see that. And, and you mentioned that in the hiring process too. And I, I, you know, I haven't been on a manager hiring process, so I'm sure you've seen that, that too. But I, I thought about tweeting out the other day, uh, if you have a growth mindset and you haven't changed your mind about anything, you know, and, and so it's just <laughs> something that, that I thought that was interesting. And I was like, ah, oh, no, I'll just, I'll just leave that one in the, in the notes section or the draft section. But <laughs> it, it, I didn't know if that spoke to me or, or not, but, but anyway, so with, with growth mindset, yeah, I think that, you know, Kyle, with most, most of our listeners, I think that they're trying to grow and they're, and they're trying to uh, embellish what you're talking about, which is, a, a, which is continually trying to learn. That's why they're listening to us today. But let's talk a little bit about, you know, you, you mentioned the managerial hiring process, which I think is, is a really, really neat thing that you've gotten to experience and, and go through uh, a couple of times, I'm sure. And so talk to us about what are what are some best practices when trying to hire good people? And so this, again, with, with our audience, with you, there may be some pro ball guys listening, but for the most part, it's, it's amateur coaches. So you're thinking college head coaches, high school head coaches, and you know, there's turnover in every organization every year. So what are some best practices in hiring people? Uh, And, and I I may digress here, but it may start with clarity of what you're looking for. Uh, But I would love to hear just your best thoughts on how to hire good people, how to keep good people and just what the hiring process for you ideally, and what, what you found over the years to be just, you know, a quote unquote, good one. Yeah. I I think I'll, I'll start with maybe sharing how my mindset has shifted 
and then give you kind of three big rocks that I, th- I think are, um, are, are critical to, to a good hiring process. I, I think all of us have probably, um, if we've ever hired someone, we've probably got a huge success story and we've probably got a huge <laughs> swing and miss story. I've got mm-hmm. lots of both. Um, fortunately was, was able to have, you know, a lot more really good ones. Um, you know, and I think some of that was evolution of, of my approach. I think a lot of it in all honesty was, was God hooking me up with just alignment of, of some talented people. Um, mm-hmm. but I think part of it for me was the mindset changing, you know, it first was a shift from filling positions to adding impact people. Um, you know, which are two different mindsets as you go th- go through that um, in terms of the standards that you have, in terms of, um, you know, how you approach it. The second mindset shift for me was because I'm more of a development minded guy, I was like, you know what, we'll get somebody in and I can get them better. Talk about growth mindset, felt like we could get them all better. And to some extent, that is true. <laughs> However, um, I you know, just what crystallized for me over time of spending a lot of, of blood, sweat and tears trying to help some guys grow. There's certain, uh, I, first of all, I'd much rather start with a higher ceiling and what they can be. Um, and then the second part is there's, there's some things that are way harder for us to impact and, and grow and develop than, than some other mm-hmm. things. You start talking about a, a technique, a skill, uh, whatever else. Yeah, we can, we can grow those up, help you communicate better. Yeah. Um, a mindset of selfishness and a, a, a defeated attitude, whatever those, those things are good luck trying to impact those in the workplace, um, you know, in a, in a meaningful way. So shifting that, that uh, as a development guy at shifting the mindset to you no know, selection matters a ton and, and let's make sure we're, we're, you know, pouring into that. And then I think the third mindset change for me was checking the ego of, um, you know, you, you don't bat a thousand. So you better have some different either processes or people involved to help you be better. Um, so I share that and I'll give you kind of what's crystallized for me, three big rocks that are, are key to my uh, belief on hiring. Um, the, the first one is, you, you joked about clarity, but it is, it's having clarity on what I am looking for, what matters in this role. And, and part of that process is going through and, and, and working through a lot of times they're the, the things that I say matter are probably priorities or style or whatever else. I need to have clarity on what really matters most for this role, because there's going to be a few things that matter most for this role that how I'm going to evaluate this role, how I'm going to want this person to perform. The other things are preferences and priorities, and we can work, work through those. Um, the, the second piece is I'm always looking. So it's not when a job comes up. It's not when a spot comes open. It's I'm always looking to add difference maker people. When that's the case, um, my source, my pool that I'm fishing for, the pond I'm fishing from is way broader. Um, Some of my best hires, I was not looking for somebody. Um, But you're meeting with somebody and you're like, wow, I'm blown away by this guy. He's really impressive. I want to figure out a way to add him. Um, or you're talking to somebody and through the conversation, it's like, hey, who else should be on my radar? Um, so that, that you're constantly cultivating that, that fishing pond that, that, you're, uh, that you're fishing in. And then the third piece for me is, um, do I have a process that is going to increase the probabilities of us making a good decision? And, and part of that process um, you know, a couple of keys for me is I wanted the process to be as realistic to what they were going to have to do as possible, which is tough to do in an interview. Um, but that may mean, um, you know, bringing guys in to actually coach with your, your team for a period of time. Um, you know, it may be, um, a, uh, situation where I have some additional, um, case studies or scenarios or whatever else. We're actually going to talk about examples. The other key uh, for a good process is that it's less about, uh, it's it's get out of the buzzword territory, right? And get into the weeds. So questions that are more tell me about, or give me an example of, or those types of things that force us to move into um, 
the application of these things and not just, you know, not just the ideas, not just the philosophical discussion. Questions about, um, especially if you're hiring somebody who has done things, tell me about those examples. I want a track record. The best predictor of future performance is past performance. I want to unpack that um, as best as I can. Um, and then the third thing that I think has been huge for us within the process is I want to expose them to as much of our culture as possible to find out how they respond to it. Do they thrive in it? Do, are they drawn to it? Um, because we, you know, the line about we're not just selecting them, they're selecting us is true. And I've got to give them, um, as much of an exposure and a taste as possible so that everybody can make a good decision. I love that. That's, that's really, really good. And, and you say, I joke about clarity. I'd never joke about clarity. Clarity is one of the most important <laughs> things that, that we can do as, as coaches and, and front office staff and, and just in whatever role that we're in, to be completely honest with you. And that's, that's really, uh, that's really something that, that over, you know, the last six months or so, I, I've really truly started to know that that really is the, the basis of, of most of the things that I'm trying to fix. Well, let me, let me but, tell you, can I tell you a quick story about that, Jonathan? Absolutely. Please do. So um, when I first got to Pittsburgh and, you know, we, again, working on the clarity piece, I had clarity on, on um, what our purpose was, but then also worked on what our core values were going to be. What were the three th- things? And, and I, I just talk about it in threes a lot. Maybe that's because of baseball. Maybe it's because, you know, science says you start getting beyond that too much and we have a hard time remembering um, but the, what were those core values that were going to guide us, uh, our left, right guardrails, if you will. And, and the first one was the idea of being relentless that as a, it's on me as a coach to help this player figure it out. I've got to use all my resources and figure out a way to get it done. Um, the second was, was systematic. We were going to have a process. We we're going to be very intentional uh, about what we were trying to get done, how we were going to go about doing it. There was going to be a plan. And we were going to constantly review that plan and keep coming back to and assess in progress. And then the third piece was was cohesive, that we were going to be connected. It was going to be one voice, one front, um, and and holistic in, in how we um, you know worked with that player, skill, mind, body, heart. So those three, and, and part of the reason why those three values were there were because um, I, I think that just human nature and traditional pro ball at the time was the opposite of those, that those three things. So constantly hammering those three things, hammering those three, three things, always looking for ways to connect something to those three things. So fast forward, I'm in um, Lynchburg, our high A affiliate at the time, about halfway through the season. And at the time, the staff there, they were on a, whatever most recent health kick. Um, they were all drinking the uh, crystal light. So they had the, the powders that you pour into the water and so I look at the desk and I see three boxes, I don't know, grape, orange, fruit punch, whatever else, but they've got them crossed out and they have relentless, systematic and, and cohesive written on there. And at first, my own immaturity, you know, I, you know, naturally twinged in terms of are, are we uh, making fun of this or whatever else. But what crystallized for me was that that clarity and then the, the consistency of it continue to drive home was starting to set in. And then they were taking ownership, having some fun with it. So I, I laugh, um, you know, you joke about the clarity piece. I don't think you can be clear enough. And there is an element of, of a broken record that, that Mm -hmm. starts to sink in with people. No, and something that I heard the other day that really made sense to me is, you know, we, we, as coaches, we hear ourselves all the time and, you know, something that, especially with clarity, if the quote was, if we are getting tired of saying it, they're finally hearing it. And I, you know, I, it goes back to if it's really important and it's something that you want done well over and over and over and over and over, you know, we, you know, me as a, as a teacher, you know, you teach five times a day and you finally, you get, you think that you're getting tired of hearing it, but they may have only truly heard it once or twice. And and so I, I love that story and, and it's nothing that, that uh, there's nothing like joking around in a clubhouse and, and getting no to doubt. see that. Well, and That's I think when I, th- I think when you get into you know what science says, and it says, you know, again, depending on what research you look at, five, seven, t- ten plus times before something really starts to sink in. Um, 
again, if I understand that, then I don't get bored by repeating myself, or I don't get bored by finding different ways to reinforce the same idea. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes we get bored as a coach <laughs> by by repeating ourselves. But uh, Patrick Lencioni talks in, in one of his books about um, you know leaders are the the great reminding officer, great reminder officer, right? That we're constantly coming back to what matters most. Because I've got so many competing ideas, so many competing um, interests, so many competing messages. I've got to be able to focus on what what matters most. Um, Larry Broadway uh, was a farm director in in, in Pittsburgh uh, after me. Very smart, talented guy. Um, you know, played at Duke, smart dude. And I remember sitting down and I asked him. I said, as a player, what did you want to know? And he goes, tell me what I'm supposed. Tell me what matters, and then just keep reminding me. And I'm like, okay, this is a pretty smart dude that that uh, is sharing this. It was a great reminder for me as a coach, as a leader, to ha- have clarity on the front end, and then don't stop banging that drum. No, oh, that's fantastic. So uh, I've got a, a couple of questions for you before we go, and these, you know, just more of quick hitters than than anything else. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on a couple of these. Uh, what is something that you'll change forever because of COVID? It's a good question. Um, I, I've joked, I, probably some things I probably should have been doing more of, washing my hands more consistently, whatever. Um, I, I think what COVID has done for me, and I hope what COVID has done for a lot of people, is it has uh, reprioritized us, what matters most, um, you know, relationships, um, Stillness, ability to slow down, the ability to to be quiet, the ability to be present. Um, I, I think those things. Um, you know, I, I think this whole thing has brought a, a has shown a light on, on those things and brought those things back to the forefront. I think the other thing it has done for me is, um, you know, just continued to challenge the the um, that faith fear part of things. Right? Um, am I going to operate out of a, a, a world of faith or am I going to operate out of a world of fear and where am I going to be getting the information I get? And then am I going to be thinking for myself to make the best decisions I can make based on all forms, but ultimately in an environment of, of faith. So I don't know how much it changed. I think for me, it it probably put some exclamation points on some things. That's wonderful. What do you think the next big thing in coaching development is? I think it's going to be the, uh, the swing back to it's going to be the art and science piece. I I think it's very science oriented right now. Some of it's really good science. Some of it is uh, latest, greatest um, fad thing, but I I think it's going to be the art and science piece. It's going to be the, the people and the task side. I think it's going to be understanding that some of these things that we think define good coaches are actually tools that good coaches use um, but if I don't have that foundation established on the front end, if I'm not good at those things, then these other enhancements um, aren't going to matter. It's the same thing as a player, right? I can't expect a player to go do Z if he can't do A, B, and C. And I think this, the same thing goes for coaches. We've probably skipped some steps and gotten down, down the line and probably need a recalibration a little bit. That's awesome. And finally, uh, the resource question, if you could buy one book for all of our listeners, what would that book be? Well, if I could buy one book, it'd be the Bible. Um, just as far as I think it is the best peak performance manual there is. Um, I, I've read so many good uh, books over the years and resources. I will share one that maybe is fitting right now. I, I've re- I read probably two or three months ago. Um, that I think could be really good as coaches are navigating this current landscape. It's called Humans Are Underrated. Um, Really good look at um, the wonderful um, strengths and and, um, enhancements that technology brings, and then also really fully grasping what makes us human, what makes us uniquely human, and where um, are humans critical to get the most out of, of, of people. Well, Kyle, I've, I've truly enjoyed our conversation today, and and let me be the first to th- say thank you so much for joining us, and and just I know I've learned a ton today, and, and I can't wait to 
put into my you know coaching handbook and 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 my skill set to say uh, the different things that that you've talked about today, and I'm really looking forward to putting it to good use. Uh, but I I will uh, I'm going to open up the mic for you, and I'm I'm just going to mute myself and give you some time. Is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners before you go? Well, I, I, the pleasure was mine, Jonathan. I, I think what you've created here um, for so many coaches, um, players, parents that, that want to get better. Um, you know, I think you've developed a really good resource here and have had some, some high quality guests. So I'm honored and humbled to get a chance to do this and spend some time with you and just hat tip to you with a ton of respect. I think, think probably the last thing that I, I would just share and, and close with, and we've talked about it some here is the authenticity piece, but, um, you know, when over the years, hiring coaches had clarity on what we were looking for. Um, I never sacrificed. I didn't feel like we ever sacrificed character for talent because we wanted good, uh, high quality people. I think the thing that um, I, I probably have missed at times is the maturity piece. And I'm going to define the maturity piece. Um, and, and I think it's and I'm sharing this because I think it's important for us. We're on this journey of trying to learn. I hope we're also ultimately growing and, and getting better specifically on the maturity side and I frame it out this way in terms of um, know yourself, love yourself, be yourself, grow yourself and then give yourself. But that, that know yourself piece is absolutely critical. I don't think we can be honest enough with ourselves in terms of what I do well, what I don't do well. Um, that's the foundation so that I can then, love myself, accept the things uh, that I do well, um, how I've been uniquely created so that I can then go be myself. That's that maturity piece is the consistency, no matter what's going on, no matter what the situation is, um, ultimately try to keep improving and be the best version of myself. That's to grow myself, but then ultimately that I can go give myself and impact people around me. Thank you for listening to Ahead of the Curve. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, which could include Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please share it on social media to help get the word out. Once again, thank you for joining us.